Amazed that someone didn't post it yet in countless slash k slash nope threads I've been in. Comes from the very first slash k slash nope thread. Heading for Inawoods with a bunch of mates somewhere in Northern Europe, we decide to hike to this old abandoned Cold War era military facility. Reach the facility after two days of hiking, it's all good, we spend the day exploring and plinking birds with point twenty two s By nightfall we set up a camp in one of the empty warehouses, we go outside, set up a campfire and start making stew. All of a sudden we hear the loudest and weirdest roar I've ever heard. We all crap ourselves, grab our rifles and stare into the darkness. Something is moving about 100 meters out, we hear it rushing through the woods into the facility area. We stand there, silent, listening, then it stops and suddenly it is dead silent all around us, just the stew slowly boiling on the fire. We look at each other and have a brief chat, we decide to carry on with making the stew. Next morning we wake up and start packing, everybody is making jokes about how we got so scared of some bear etc. My buddy sees something lurking on top of the biggest facility building. We try to have a look at what it is, but it's too far away, some 200 meters maybe. It is just standing there, with two legs, probably staring at us. The thing is huge, maybe over 7 feet tall, I reach for my binoculars to have a good look on who is trolling us with ghillie suits, just as I find the binos my mates start shouting. I look at the creature, or whatever it was, and it seems to be running via the facility wall like a lizard, very very fast. By now it is clear it is not a human, nor any animal I know of, it disappears behind one big bunker structure. We decide to nope the hell out of there, we're scared as hell even though it is day. As we are hiking back we don't take any breaks before nightfall, as the sun sets down, we make a camp and start preparing supper, everyone's a little tense and we try to joke around. I mean the very first slash k slash nope thread I was a part of. It's a very long one, someone may want to scream cap it. We decide to do guard duty during the night, my shift is 0103, birds are singing like crazy, they do that during the night here, and I managed to see a lone rabbit hopping around our campsite, I would have popped him, but I wanted to let my buddies rest. Suddenly the bird stops singing and the rabbit stops, raises its head like it's listening to something. The rabbit nopes out of there very fast like it's running for its life. I feel very uneasy and flick on my flashlight and shine it towards the darkness. I'm hoping to see a glimpse of a fox etc that could have explained the strange behavior of the other animals, but the forest around us seems empty, just as I'm putting the light out I see something move behind the bushes around 100 meters away, it was something big. I shine the light directly at the bushes and try to get a look through my 10-22s scope, I manage to see something moving there and I believe I saw a pair of yellowish eyes, then it stands up. I don't know to this day what the hell it was, but it was hairy looking, very dark and had a face, the face of lighter color and there were two yellow eyes, the thing was around 7 feet tall, somewhat human shaped, although I didn't get a very clear look with my trash deer flashlight I was 100% sure that that thing wasn't a human so I started panicking, raised my gun and lit him up. I emptied the whole 25 RD Butler Creek mag in about 3 seconds, I didn't even aim, my buddies woke up and started shouting and it was all chaos for half a minute, I tried to tell them what had happened as fast as I could. Having dropped my flashlight I didn't know if the creature had been hit or if it was there anymore, one of my buddies picked up the light and directed it at the direction I was pointing my gun at, and there it was, just standing. Suddenly the thing just kind of falls down and starts slithering at us, making no noise at all, we start screaming, grab our packs and guns and start noping out of there, we must have ran like 10 kilometers straight up before taking a break, all of us were shaking, we didn't share a word, we walked the rest of the way to the public campground in DEFCON 1, weapons ready and listening to every crack. I've never been as happy as I was when I saw some German tourists grilling sausages by their RV. They were all like WTF when we exited the woods with guns in low ready stance, we said nothing, walked to our car and drove away breaking pretty much every speed limit on the way. We talked about the thing on the way home. None of us knew what it was but everyone had seen it and everyone was convinced that it was not a human nor a normal animal of any sort. We decided to stay away from the woods for a while. 
Problem is that the wildlife around here is scared of people, even children. And there hasn't been one bear sighting in over 80 years. Last summer we decided to be tough guys and find out what the hell that thing was. This time we would go with three ATVs, in case we would have to bail out fast. We took two cameras, 3.308s and 112.76 with slugs, there were four of us by the way, load of survival gear and one of my buddies managed to get a Gen 2 NV camera. We also had seven pipe bombs, black powder in two inch iron tubing with caps at the end plus visco fuse, in case things got out of hand. Yeah, it was kind of lame fake operator tier thing, but we thought we'd get all famous if we actually killed it or got footage of it. Anyways, we entered the woods with our gear and headed for the facility, again at the facility, everything looks normal and birds are singing again, no sign of anything abnormal, we decide to map the surrounding area and look for anything suspicious, nothing was found, we make camp at the very same warehouse as we did the last time. Night falls and everything is still normal, we have guard shifts during the night but nothing happens, next day we start exploring the woods area around the facility, we find a peculiar pile of dead trees, looked like someone had hauled them there. We take a closer look, the trees are arranged in a fashion similar to a huge bird's nest, in the middle of the nest, there is one half-rotten moose carcass and a load of different animal bones, we start quietly noping back to our campsite, we park our ATVs next to the warehouse we keep our camp in, we enter the camp warehouse and see our camping gear all torn up, the somewhat expensive cameras smashed to against the floor, food taken and sleeping bags torn to pieces, damn, we take everything we could in like a minute and start driving the hell out of Dodge. It's evening by the time we get back to the public campground, a police officer stops us by the gates and checks our gun permits. Then the officer proceeds by asking whether we wanted to volunteer for a search operation, our ATVs would be much appreciated, some hiker had apparently gone missing in the nearby forest, 20 kilometers from the facility site, we look at each other and shake our head, one of my buddies quickly says something about being late and we drive out of there, the dude who went missing was never found. We decided that we wouldn't go in a woodsing in that part of the country anymore. In the other thread some folks were talking about getting together to go out and fighting evil. Beings in a woods? Well, hey, I have a story about doing just that. Be 18 fresh out of high school. No job. Have all summer to mess around. Joking with my cousin about going out and hunting monsters after much deliberation. We decide to go looking for nasties. We tell our parents we're going on a camping trip. Cousin finds a few guys with spooky stories on the internet. A select few are down with us coming by to have a look. Not really expect anything. But pack ups and a few hundred rounds of chink surplus ammo. My cousin, his friend James, and I hop in my cousin's truck and head up to the upper peninsula. Since we had two leads from that area. First place is a joke. Dude suspects a body of some sort is tormenting him. He's just coyotes. Next day head to the next place now things get serious. Landowner dude tells us a story about how he and his friends were camping way back in the woods. And that he was stalked by some sort of humanoid near an old abandoned house in the woods. Landowner leads us out to the place, packing a 30 to 30. The forest seems unusually silent. So we set up camp. That night I woke up to the sounds of shooting. Jim is outside with his Mossberg shooting into the dark. Says he couldn't sleep and saw something scurrying around on all fours checking out the camp. Calm dude down, we sleep in shifts, next morning we found blood near the camp, if it bleeds, we can kill it, eat breakfast and walk around for hours, until we come to an abandoned house, we decided to check it out, check out the ground floor, and upstairs first, don't find anything but old furniture and stuff, we need to go into the basement, basement is pitch dark, draw straws, I get the short one, I have to go in first, on the third step down a gut wrenching scream rings out from the basement, I fall on my ass from fright and slide down a few steps before catching myself. A humanoid figure on all fours is bounding up the steps. It has dark brown skin and razor teeth. Tried to shoulder SKS. It gets a few steps in front of me before I can shoulder my weapon. Cousin hits it with .357 the thing is hardly phased. I kick it, knocking it back just enough to shoulder my SKS and mag dump the thing. After much convulsing the thing stops moving. And I kid you not, the thing turned to dust. It turned to dust right in front of my goddamn eyes. The damn thing was screaming the whole time, 
It was unlike anything I had ever heard. We let the landowner know what happened and we left. We don't really talk about it anymore. Sometimes while I work or go to school I get the feeling that I was born to protect people from things like that. I haven't gone looking for monsters since, but I feel like working and going to college is a waste of my time and that I was put on earth to hunt these things. I'm a junkie. There's this heroin, coke dealer who has his little crew and is always throwing cash around. Doing dumb stuff. One day, I'm over there buying my supplies for the day. They announce they're all going camping they love to do impulsive random things. I beg to go with I love camping, especially with crazy, cool people such as these folks. We leave Minneapolis to the wilderness outside Duluth, a group of seven people. Setting up camp is disorganized as hell. One couple is already fucking in their tent, lol. With all the chaos and getting high, events weren't clear until later. Two dudes go to get firewood and make sure nobody else is around to see us using needles and call. The cops, nobody really takes note, cares to remember they leave. 30 minutes later, one guy comes back. Where's the other one? It, I went for wood. He went to make sure we were safe to get high. Whatever, he's probably just nodding off somewhere. To goddamn hours later, the other guy strolls into camp, looking very not high. Where were you? Oh, looking at birds, lol. What the hell? What junkie likes bird watching? Nighttime comes around. The dude who came back later is acting strange, seems generally confused by our weird activities. Looks almost pissed confused, he sits down on a log by fire suddenly, awkwardly. Like he's really drunk hard junkies don't drink. Junkies are acting strange always. Whatever. It's been almost nine hours since we arrived. People are getting dope sick people withdrawal. Time to get stoned. Dope is passed around. Everyone desperately starts cooking up. Between cooking and strapping up, I notice the guy just smelling the chunk of dope. Looking like he can't handle the smell. WTF again. Everyone's done shooting up. But the guy is still sniffing the chunk, by now everyone notices. He cautiously licks the dope has an incredibly strong taste and smell of uber vinegar. He makes this horrible animal gagging. Hacking sound? What? The main dealer guy offers to cook and prepare the shot for him. He was already high and didn't notice the strange behavior too much. The guy mumbles Maya and gets shot up. Note. Your average junkie does enough dope in one shot to kill King Kong and his whole family. Tolerance is a bitch. The guy's whole body starts to shake. His eyes are popping out. Everyone's still staring with dopey glazed eyes. He makes this strange panic choking breathing sound. Like there's a really wet towel in his mouth or throat. Blood literally pops out of his nose, incredibly dark colored. He starts to make an intense high-pitched screeching scream noise. Stopping to choke, cough suddenly every second or two, these are not normal OD symptoms, a horrible, horrible stench permeates the camp, holy damn, he falls over backwards, panic ensues, dude. You gave him too much, fuck, fuck, the main guy goes to help him up, but can't. The stench increases to the point where the rest of us are gagging and or puking. I hear a very distant scream from the forest amid the panic. I think nobody else notices. I hear other screams, screeching join in, everywhere. What the hell? The panic levels cannot be contained. Junkies are screaming inside the camp too. Screeching outside the camp grows and grows. Ears are ringing. Stench is clogging my lungs. Can't take it. The overwhelming smell and high-pitched ringing are too much to handle. I black out. I woke up in the morning, look around, very shaky, I can smell hints of stench from last night. Nobody to be seen, except that guy, the goddamn guy. Boots sticking up from the log he fell off of, I walk over slowly. He looks like he's been dead for weeks, skin tight over his face, white and blue. Eyes sunken. Looks like he lost 80 pounds before dying. Blood is covering him, I DK from where. I realize I am covered in blood too. There are scrapes and dent holes all over the ground. Some obviously animal tracks, human footprints, handprints, and combinations of all. 
Some seem to be dragged, withdrawing and losing my mind. I steal the main dealer's car, go home, and never speak of it again. I never heard a word from or about any of those people ever again, except for one girl who got put in a psych ward I heard, never visited her. I'm a reenactor too. Blanks flash like a motherfucker, more so than live ammunition. They're a lot noisier too. Blank firing adapters are easy as hell to get for any decently common firearm. They range from like $8 for Comblock surplus training BFAs for AKS and such, to $100 plus US made fancy low profile BFAs. I think you have a very vague understanding of how a blank works. A BFA doesn't plug the barrel, what it does is constrict it to about 3 millimeters. speaking of BFAs, I have a somewhat related story. Being in the early 90s, out doing World War II reenactment, on the German side as Fallschirmjagers. It was a good day of firefights, driving around in a cubal wagon while in firefights, and napping during firefights when night falls. Sitting around the fire with my buddy, he was our machine gunner and I was his loader. He's got a semi-auto converted MG42 because he has far too much time and money on his hands. I have a carabiner 98k. Suddenly, we hear, in a crappy German accent, Americaner, 12 o'clock. An American airborne dude wanders out of the bushes in front of us. He's a quiet guy, we didn't hear or notice him tramping through the brush. The actual reenactment ended long ago, next engagement is tomorrow so we don't light him up. He walks up to our campfire and sits down, and says, this time with a standard Pacific Northwest accent, Tim, wanna have a cigarette with me? My name is Dom, close enough. Wait why the hell is he addressing me by name, I've never even seen this dude before. Must be a new guy, the other Americans probably named us. Ja, EIN moment. I produce cigarettes and matches. Hand a cigarette to him, and one to my buddy, strike a match and light my own, then pass matches around. The American dude is smoking hard, like taking a huge drag every second, practically shoving the cigarette into his face. He's done with it in like 30 seconds, drops the butt on the ground, doesn't extinguish it. I figure it's a combination of him probably being drunk, like us, and the long marches. After we finish our smokes, the dude just sits there and stares at the fire silently for like 5 minutes. So what's your name? Johan, you can call me John if you want. There's a guy on the American side named Johan who goes by John, except this isn't him, and I've known the other Johan for like 3 years at this point. Hell of a coincidence, did you meet the other Johan? He just smiles at us, not even a smile, more like pulling his lips back like a growling dog. We hear a bunch of crashing in the bushes behind where Creepy John came out. An American airborne walks out of the bushes, visibly annoyed. Hey asshole, would you mind giving us back Tim's kit? That stuff isn't cool. He's freezing, it's 35 degrees out. He looks over to us. And why the hell didn't you turn him around as soon as he got back here? I told you guys to stop letting teenagers into your group, referring to an incident in which a drunk 16-year-old nearly burned down airborne number no. 2's tent. We drop the German accents, we very rarely go out of character unless someone gets injured. Dude, we don't know this guy, we thought he was one of yours. The creepy dude is mock reloading his rifle, like moving his hand over to his bandolier, not actually pulling anything out, and putting nothing into the breech of his M1 rifle. He does this like three times while we all just stare at him. Suddenly jolts upright, starts laughing like crazy, more like an inhuman cackle. We all take a step back, airborne number two and I unslung our rifles while my buddy grabs his MG. My buddy shouts, drop that rifle and get on the ground, we're calling the sheriff's department. We all think he's an inbred axe murderer or something. Airborne number two is known for being a balsa dude makes a grab for his rifle. Suddenly he just isn't there. Scan right, scan left, he's six inches to my left, grinning at me. His mouth looks like it grew two inches wider, eyes are all red, like all of his blood vessels popped, 
arms are hanging like six inches past the end of his uniform sleeves. Dive backwards onto ground and fire a blank at him simultaneously. Flash blinds me for a fraction of a second. Work the bolt on my rifle furiously, about to fire another shot before I realize he's gone. We all scan, he's now in a bush about 10m to our 130. All three of us light him up. At this point, the other six guys in our unit are out of their tents. What the hell are you doing you goddamn, what the hell is that? Dude is hunched over, heaving like he's about to throw up. Bolts back up, lets out a guttural scream, says, in what I can only compare to a mimicry of human speech, AI I am gonna gut at you, you crow out suins you bitches, everyone else scrambles for their guns and starts firing. Our sniper produces the .44 revolver he carries for bare defense, fires a live round at the thing as it just stands there. It curls over from the impact, howls in pain, and dashes out into the bushes uphill to our right. We all march over, weapons raised, to check if there's any blood. No blood. Our guy is adamant that he hit it. We search around in the bushes, and eventually find the rifle and helmet it took from the Real Tim, find the bandolier torn off a little farther up, with a bullet hole in it. Guttural screaming from what sounds like maybe 30m away. We all book it back to the campsite, just as the rest of the Americans are arriving. The American sergeant walks up, fuming. Hey, thanks for waking us all up with your drunken bullshit. Tim Actual is there too, wrapped in a blanket and wearing someone's spare boots. The sergeant notices we're all pale as hell, cools off a bit. You guys alright? You look a bit shaken up. Describe the situation to him as MG Buddy breaks out his Motorola Microtac and calls 911, wait for the sheriff to arrive. Form a defensive perimeter and fix bayonets, wait for the sheriff to arrive. We hear the sirens in the distance, sprint the full mile to where the road ends, arrive with rifles slung and hands up. Three squad cars, five deputies plus the sheriff step out, all are armed with shotguns. Get the feeling that this has happened before, they politely ask us to unswitch and put down our weapons. I wish I could tell this story properly. This was the one night in my life I was truly wondering whether I would die or not. This was probably 10 years ago. Put this map in a separate window, if you want so you can kinda get an idea of where we were at. During different points in the story, for the backstory. Our location is basically in the middle of now. Here Minnesota and 30 minutes from the nearest town big enough for a Walmart. And an hour away from any town big enough to have a normal, albeit small mall. I hope that gives you an idea how middle of nowhere we were. I had this friend. Brandon, who was my main shooting friend. We'd always launch off about 1000 rounds of Tatula at gravel pits etc. Every couple weeks it seemed like. We trusted each other like I've never experienced since with anyone as far as firearms and general camaraderie. He had a history of being kind of a troublemaker, but was fine around me, partially at least because we didn't go see his other friends while I was with. They were kind of a bunch of douchebags I thought and I didn't want anything to do with them for the most part. He has since abandoned them and realizes that they were nothing but a bad influence. I was so glad to hear that. So one afternoon when we hung out, Brandon mentioned this abandoned farm site that had a lot of rabbits and a couple buildings. So of course, he decided we'd go a little later and hunt it out and see what we could find. It was supposedly full of rabbits every time he'd been there. The catch today was that there was a new guy in our normally two-man group. A cousin that Brandon wasn't very fond of and Brandon thought was kind of an idiot. My opinion of him would be equally low by the end of the day though. He really was an idiot. His name was Travis. I tried to give him the benefit of a doubt. But this kid really was a dumb neckbeer and it didn't take long for me to realize it. Anyway, later in the afternoon, we parked the truck at the end of the driveway to keep the element of surprise and sneak up the driveway as quietly as possible. It was probably a little over one eighth mile to the actual abandoned farm site. About half the length of the driveway was corn taller than us. The other half was the thin driveway surrounded by trees on both sides. On one side of the driveway was the main growth. The other was a 10-foot thick wall of trees with tall corn on the other side. It was late afternoon, not too far from sunset, so we had a spotlight in case we stayed past dark. After the end of the day I'd wish we'd left it home. 
This is where it all really begins. We walked up the thin driveway surrounded by trees on both sides and eventually broke off and checked out the woods together. There were a lot of details that we noticed as the day went that were not quite right about the place, but we didn't really put it all together until it turned into the crazy night trapped up on that farm site. We went through the woods first. There were puffs made already and plants that looked like they'd just been broken off because they were still bleeding water where it had snapped. We figured it was a deer or something we'd scared up. As we went to the bar, we noticed claw marks all over the ladder to get upstairs and pretty much zero cobwebs or signs of life other than those claw marks on the ladder runs. Actually, there were no rabbits or any life whatsoever on the place it seemed like, no birds, squirrels or anything. Not even flies or spiders, we did think that was a little on the weird side for an abandoned farm. There's not generally a lot going on at abandoned places, but this was on a different level. As time passed, it started to get dark. We had been shooting on and off at different pieces of junk lying around for most of the time we had been there. Maybe two hours. We had to Ruger 10, 22s between the three of us and my 20 guy 870 pump shotgun. Travis didn't have his own gun. So he used whatever we gave him at the time, usually a 22, as night set in. We grabbed the spotlight and kept exploring around the edges of the woods and behind the buildings. It took about 5 minutes, and the spotlight was dead even though we didn't use it much. The battery must have been crap. We were about to call it a night when we heard something rustling in the woods past some shrubby trees. We kept hearing it, so we shot into the area and they quit for a minute. Then it came back again somewhere else but in the same general direction. Because of this nose, we stayed past dark because we figured it was kinda a fun excuse to keep going. By now it was very dark, but it was a full moon so we could still see fairly well, but could see absolutely nothing in the woods, inside of the buildings, or anywhere inside the shadows. We kept hearing the thing running and moving through the woods with more and more frequency as time went on. It would go away for a few minutes, then we'd hear it on the other side of the hearing it change clearing behind us. It was at this point we started to get freaked out because we kept hearing places every few few minutes and it seemed to be stalking us. Eventually we saw it jump out of the woods a foot or two and dart back in. We couldn't tell what it was. But it had a silverish glow in the tell while glow in moonlight. It was the size of a medium large dog but quick as a cat. Now we knew this wasn't just us hearing things and of course freaked us out even more. This went on for a long time with us just standing there trying to figure out how to get out of this mess. We were all scared shitless for hours shooting into the shadows occasionally trying to hit it. And of course, we didn't want to go down the thin driveway with trees on both sides of it and almost no light. We were prepared to stay there all night keeping guard if we had to. At the time, cell phones were almost unheard of for most people. So we didn't have any communication either because we would have used it by the end. An hour or two into the ordeal we started hearing this thing from two places at once or from both sides too fast for it to be only one thing crunching around out there. We stood there and kind of backed off from the noses we were hearing because it's natural instinct to kind of back away. But we soon realized it was trying to push us into a thinner clearing and we were almost sure they meant to do that. I'm pretty sure they wanted to get us somewhere where they could attack us from all sides quickly. From that point forward we just stayed in the center of the largest clearing no matter what we heard. At least there was about 30 feet at least between us and the woods in all directions there. We'd have time to shoot at anything that came for us from that distance. Eventually around midnight 1 am we decided we'd make a run for it down the driveway. We had just decided that the three of us would be back to back to back in kind of a triangle. Formation covering all sides on our escape. Whatever these things were, they seemed damn fast and very unfriendly and unafraid of gunfire. We were 100% convinced that if we got close to the woods, they would come after us though. So we were faced with a tough decision with the thin driveway being our only escape. We'd finally made the decision to abandon the spotlight, each take a gun and make our escape. Me and Travis would have the 22s, and Brandon would carry my 20 ga. Unfortunately Travis wouldn't abandon the dead spotlight, so he took it with him for some reason. He was clutching onto a dead spotlight more than his rifle and we couldn't convince him to set it down even though it had zero charge. Finally we just decided he could take it with him on the way down the driveway. We just wanted to get the hell out of there. We were just about to leave and then we heard the noses from both sides again. And within a few seconds, I saw one of them run across the clearing on the far side of the farm site. That was not good news. It was scary enough that there might be two. 
Now we pretty much confirmed that there were at least three. We made up our minds, went back to back and started down the driveway, while we knew at least one was on the opposite side of the farm and ran the wrong way to intercept. US on the driveway, we finally took off. We were kinda making a slow escape with Brandon and I facing the main section of woods, and Travis facing the field because we wanted to be the ones facing the most likely attack point, since Travis was too scared to handle anything but a dead spotlight, and really couldn't have famed and shot if he wanted to because he was clutching that dead spotlight like it was his salvation. As we went along, we heard them running kinda alongside us and we were really wondering if trying to escape had been a good idea or not. We were about halfway down the driveway, and one of them naturally lunged at Brandon and my side. Brandon pretty much instantly fired the 20 gun surprise and the M surprise and the critter ran off. I'm sure the critter ran off just because the blast surprised him just as much. It was there and gone so fast that we still didn't know what it was exactly. But we were as scared as we'd ever been because the woods were maybe six feet on either side of us. And those things were fast as hell. After we cleared the grove, we actually didn't hear anything in the cornrows next to us, but that doesn't mean much. It's not hard for an animal to move quietly on black dirt between the rows. After a few terrifying minutes, we eventually made it to the vehicle, threw our stuff in and rolled up the windows. We breathed a sigh of relief and tried to figure out what the hell just happened for a good while, before starting the engine and heading back to his place. We actually decided to go back the same night, after dropping off the dead spotlight wielding douche. At his uncle's place, we took a car instead of the pickup, rolled up the windows and drove up the driveway. I actually saw one of them lunge towards my window quickly and bolt back into the woods once while going up the driveway, and that was the last we saw of them with our eyes. We parked up next to the woods though and rolled down a window a crack so we could hear better. The damn thing was about six feet away from my passenger window a few times, but I could never see it in the dim light, but I could sure as hell hear it and so could Brandon. We tried to flash on the car's lights a couple times just to try to catch one in the open, but we never had the right timing. A day later we brought the truck back up there and camped out in the back. We wanted to kill one of these things and figure out what it was. We thought maybe one of them was out there. But we never really could tell for sure if we were just parano and hearing things at that point. We thought we may have heard them, but there was a breeze so it could have just been swaying branches. I still have no idea what it was. We're in west central Minnesota, and our only ideas of what it could be are wolves most likely or some kind of mountain lion out of the normal lion territory. The reason we thought of mountain lions is just because they had such cab-like speed, and supposedly it's happened before. In the end, I'll never know for sure. I have only shared this one with a few people, and still when I think about it, it freaks me the hell out. I was 16 or so, and growing up in a small town, exploring out in the hills was the thing to do. This incident took place at the north end of Ruby Valley in Elko County, Nevada. Someday, I will play around on Google Earth to try to find this place, but it is slightly north of the road off of Highway 93 that goes into Ruby Valley. I always like checking out old mine shafts and ghost towns. That sheet really intrigues me. At the Burger Bar in Wells, Nevada, where I am from and grew up, they had these old tum of the century maps under glass on the tables. On one of them, it showed several ghost towns just north of Ruby Valley, so figured I would go check them out. As I had not been in the area very often, I gassed up my 72 Dodge W200 pickup, and being a redneck and, K, before fortune even, I grabbed my HK91 and set out. I had found some old foundations in the lower country, and started heading into the mountains themselves, and started finding abandoned mine shafts. Sheet was pretty cool, so I kept going up. I took this ancient road, that was no more than an overgrown cattle path by this point in history, and came upon a tree blocking the road. It was an old pinion pine about two feet in diameter, that blocked the road. After the tree the road continued straight for about 200 yards then hooked right before coming back 180 degrees. Continuing, I'm going to sketch up some key locations for my next post. I parked my truck in front of the tree, and set out on foot. I grabbed my HK91 with 120 round magazine in the rifle, and put 120 round magazine in my back left pocket. I always had a rifle with me, as I have encountered mountain lions in mine shafts before, and just generally I like to shoot sheet, get up on ridge lines and shoot boulders from a couple hundred yards away. Anyways, as soon as I climbed over the fallen tree I had a creepy feeling, as if I was being watched. I continued on for about 200 yards to the point where the road started curving right and gaining elevation, 
going towards the cabin, at this point I had the realization that not only did I feel like I was being watched, it was also dead quiet out. This was in June or so, as school had just got out. Everywhere you went you could hear those cicadas, but not here. It seemed as soon as I crossed the fallen tree, the mountains were silent. No bugs, no birds, nothing. Deafening silence. As I came up to the turn, there was this big rock. The thing had to be about 15 feet in diameter. You could tell that it used to be on the road, but due to years of erosion, snow and all that sheet, it had slid down just slightly off the road. It seemed to be red limestone, or something like that. It stood out since they are not that common in this area. I looked at the rock and you could tell that there were carvings in it, at some point in time. Due to weathering though, whatever was carved on it had been worn off. I kept walking up the road, being creeped, but I really wanted to check out the old cabin, as it was pretty obvious no one had been here in quite a while. At this point I was probably three hours off-road to get to this point. You are going to be going through Wells, which is closer to where this happened, probably about 30-ish miles south as the crow flies from there. After I post everything I will look on Google Maps and see if I can find this cabin there. I got up to the cabin and as far as abandoned houses and cabins in Nevada go, this one was in pretty good shape. All of the glass on the windows was still intact and there were remnants of curtains behind the windows. By this point there was something in the back of my mind telling me that I should be going. I went into the cabin, and that is where I started to get the feeling that something was off. Most cabins you find out in the middle of nowhere in Nevada are barren. Nothing really left, maybe a bit of broken furniture. This one was completely furnished. Time had taken its toll, but everything was still there. What was left of an old mattress and bedding was still there. There were plates and other cookware throughout the house, along with tattered clothing and personal effects such as a chest, faded pictures and the like. What really creeped me out was the dinner table. It was set for four people. Dinner plate, glasses, and silverware. This was the first cabin I had ever found that was in this condition. It was as if whoever resided here had just up and left everything behind. I felt like I should not be in the cabin and went outside to see if I could find the mineshaft or anything else. Once I was out the door, I decided to chamber around on my HK91. The sound of me racking around and echoed through the canyon and broke the silence. As little of a thing as it was, this calmed my nerves very slightly. Directly behind the cabin was a well. It was still intact, and as I got closer, it sounded like there was noise coming from it, like a slight breeze rustling through it. When I got within about 30 feet of it, I started to smell something. It smelled absolutely putrid. Definitely something had died in the well. The smell of decay was heavy in the air, with an acrid copper scent that tore at my nostrils. I did not want to get any closer to the well, and started walking towards the left, where I could see the opening to a mineshaft up on the hill. The closer I got to it, I could start feeling a breeze coming out of it. This is not really uncommon if you have explored mine shafts before, as the breeze could be coming in from another opening for the mine. But the thing was, it was perfectly calm. As far as I could see, there were no trees moving or any signs of wind. As I got closer another thing that struck me as odd was the breeze coming out of the shaft was hot. Most of the time it is cool, as most mine shafts maintain a constant temperature. The closer I got to the shaft the slower I moved towards it. Nothing since I crossed the fallen tree seemed right. The closer I got to the opening of the mine shaft the more of a feeling of dread and being watched I got. I got within about 15 feet of the shaft when the smell hit me. It was the smell of decay and copper, but much stronger than the well. Right then all of my spidey senses started going off. I had to get out of there. I started turning left to book it out of there when I saw a dark shadow moving in the opening of the mine shaft. Whatever it was, it appeared to be crouched down to fit in the mine shaft. Most mine shafts I have been in have 8-10 feet ceilings. At first I thought it was a mountain lion, then I remembered how big the shafts were. My mind raced trying to think WTF it was. It was too big to be a black bear, which are rare in De Nevada. I nearly froze with panic, and it slowly kept coming towards the opening of the mine shaft. It was probably within 10 feet of the opening, and the light was starting to show whatever it was was covered, from head to toe in grayish brown fur. Then it screamed. It was unlike anything I have ever heard in my life my ears were ringing from it. I flipped into panic mode, and did what any good redneck would do. I shot it. I pulled up my HK91, placed the front blade on what appeared to be its center mass, and ripped off five rounds as fast as I could accurately shoot. If you have ever shot big game with a large caliber rifle, you know the sound when you connect with something. I had four solid thwunks, and one round, that went high. This made it scream even louder than it had, in pain. At this time I started hearing more, and separate screams coming from over in the well and in the hills above the mineshaft. I started running down the hill as fast as I could. In the tree line above the road, 
approximately 75 125 yards i could see fast movement rocks were tumbling down the hill and there were several other screams from the mine shaft i could hear the wailing of whatever the heli had shot whatever it was i had definitely connected and it was hurting whatever it was up in the tree line they were running from tree to tree on all fours getting closer to me as i ran towards the rock i was shooting in the general vicinity of the movement on the top of the hill by the time i got to the limestone rock i had expended the 20 round mag and the rifle i ripped it out and put in my spare magazine chambered around and started sprinting towards the fallen tree approximately 200 yards away by now i kept glancing back and whatever they were they were staying in the trees I could make out their masses, and fur but they would not stay in the open. I got back to the fallen tree, and ate sheet trying to jump over it. I got up off my ass, fired between 12-15 rounds at the closest movement, which was approximately 50 yards away from now. I heard a few rounds connect and it started screaming louder. Between the screaming and gunshots, my ears were damned near dear. I opened the door of my truck, and got the fuck in and started it up as fast as I could. Backing up to turn around I damned near put my truck down in the canyon. As I started going forward, to leave on the road I came in on was when I finally got a look at one of them. It was crouched over with its front feet on the tree. It was covered from head to toe in grayish brown fur, with long slender fingers with claws tipping off the fingers. The back of it was hunched, and the face was slender, most closely resembling that of a badger, but with sunken eyes. It was shaking its head back and forth, and it sounded like it was attempting to speak, but it was so garbled, and with the noise of my truck I could not make out WTF it was. I averaged 50-60 miles per hour on a worn out dirt road that I had done 15 on on the way in. I did not slow down or stop until I got back to the pavement. By now I was so shaken I had to stop and collect myself. I got back to town and was in a bit of shock. My dad had been a guide in the Ruby Mountains for about 20 years. He asked me how my trip went and where I went. He could tell that I was startled and asked where I had been. I told him that I had been north of Ruby Valley. He got quiet and asked if I had seen a cabin with a tree fallen over the road. I told him yes. He looked me in the eyes and told me that is somewhere I should never go again, especially alone. We never spoke about it again after that. I have never been back there, part of the reason is I live in western Nevada now, but in the back of my mind there is something that is telling me I should go back, and one day I do want to go back. This was back in 2001, before camera phones, and I was too broke to afford a digital camera. I want to go back with a camera preferably a GoPro on my helmet, and with several friends that are armed. Just something about there, even with the things I experienced is drawing me back. One day, I will go back. I guess I need closure on what happened that day. I will probably be on for another 30 minutes or so if anyone has any questions. After that, I can be reached by email. Stand by, I will sketch it up. My drawing skills are bad so it will be rough. Definitely want to make it back out there with at least 4-5 people well armed that is for damned sure. Still to this day it gives me goosebumps thinking about this. I tried researching it a bit a few years ago, asking some old timers, and one of them told me a story about the rubbies. I will be quick on it. During the 1940s and 1950s the Army Air Corp operated out of the Wendover Air Base. Every now and then during crappy weather, a B-25, B-17 or B-29 would smack the rubbies due to poor visibility. Some of the local ranchers got recruited to help the military go up to a crash site during the winter to recover the bodies. The rancher I was talking to told me that it took them about three days to get up to where this crash was on horseback and recover the bodies. He said when they got to the wreckage, all of the crew members were laid out, side by side, next to each other in a clearing in the wreckage. Many of them had severed limbs, and it was apparent all died on impact. Somehow, they ended up laid out next to each other. This was at nearly 10k feet elevation too. Evening, K. I've always enjoyed two spooky in a woods threads, so I thought I'd start one. This story is pretty long, so I'll use a trip to post it and then go back to being a nun. Even in high school in the mid 2000s, I moved to Utah to work for an electrician for the summer. It was hot, I always did bitch work because lol the youngest worker, but paid decent, good hours and was kind of fun. Every day after work, I would hang out with my female cousin A and her boyfriend D and their friends. One friend, Jay, was Native American and lived on a nearby reservation. He was a nice guy but majorly superstitious. One evening, we're in the front room telling ghost stories. 
Jay starts telling a local legend about a skinwalker. Poor young Naibmi knew nothing about them. According to local legend, some tribesmen long ago messed up and got cursed. He must walk the earth until he redeems himself, but of course, he's pissed off about this, so he possesses other living things. Anyway, out in the area, there was this old farm near the reservation that always had weird things happen on it. Crops failed for no reason, residents saw and heard strange things, a barn burned down right after being built, and there were constant accidents. The creepiest thing was the cattle. They would disappear, reappear a day or so later full of holes like Swiss cheese, or drained of blood with no wounds, eyes, or organs removed with surgical precision. People refused to stay for long, and land ownership changed hands every few years. The government eventually bought it, fenced it all off, and set up sensors and such, like Area 51 but with fewer aliens and more fry sauce. People on the reservation always knew if something happened there because the whole damn place would light up like a Christmas tree, alarms and sirens and shit too, so Jay tells us about this, and we're all young and stupid and tell him he must take us out there. To get on the reservation, you have to be a Ute or have one sign you on. He, of course, says hell no, his grandpa told him to stay away from there like the plague. We badger him, promising it'll be quick, just a look and we'll leave. Eventually, he relents. The sun had set by the time we left, so I grabbed a flashlight on the way out. I also grab a 30 to 30 off of the rack, and a freaks out. What are you going to do, shoot a skinwalker if I have to, and I'll get its head mounted afterward, you stupid bastard, leave me alone. We get there, it was like a 30, men drive and A and D are acting all antsy the whole time so J is on edge. He tells us to stay close, stay quiet, and do what he says. We park the Wrangler on the side of the road and hop a cattle fence, walk across a field and through some woods. Thanks to A's incessant bitching, I left the rifle in the jeep, which was against my better judgment but what can you do it's quiet as we head toward the farm, you know, the type of quiet that roars like a jet engine. I start feeling like someone is whispering to me from far away, and it's carried to me on the wind. Creep can level raised from weird to definitely unsettling. A and D are both absorbed into their phones, dumb shit's too distracted, but J still looks somewhere between wary and scared. He kept stopping us and listening and looking before continuing. We clear the woods and reach another field. Halfway across, Jay stops and turns around, refusing to go any further. I walk up to him to pat him on the shoulder and tell him it's alright, I reach him, and it's like I stepped out of a sauna into Antarctica, suddenly cold. A feeling washes over me, can only describe it as unwanted. Seriously like my mama had told me to go away and never return. I felt like crying, and I felt dejected. And just as suddenly, it was gone. The looks on everyone's faces said they'd felt it too. Creep can level now at too spooky. Jay says we go back, us dumb shit white teenagers say forward. D wants to look tough for A, A would follow him anywhere, I'm just an idiot. Jay again relents, in retrospect, I wish he'd had more spine. We finish crossing the field. We hit the next tree lean, and a chain link fence is within view. The second I crossed the line, feelings of anger and rejection slammed me like a sack of bricks. Think back to when you were a kid and just got punished for something you didn't do, that sort of feeling, rage against someone else with no outlet. And then it's gone, and I'm what the fucking hard. None of us are moving, I take a few steps forward and boom more emotions. Fear and hatred, so strong it was bitter in my mouth like dried blood. And then it's gone, Jay is flipping out, whimpering, 
saying that something was very very wrong and we need to leave. A and D agree, I do too but tell them to wait one second. You see, as far as I can tell I was a masochist but without the pleasure part. I push forward and reach the fence. Disappointing, really, tall fence without barbed wire, not electrified, a few small buildings and a bunch of stadium lights and shit like that. Just barren and boring, and I'm so overcome by the meh of it all that I just turn around and walk away. I walk up to them and tell them we're good to go, they didn't miss anything, and Jay is all finally. We started heading back to the tree lean to cross the field where I felt abandoned, and again on that border we all stopped, but this was unplanned, we just all did it in unison without reason. It's quiet, still, unnaturally so, my hackles are up. Moving my head felt impossible, air was physically hard, like a solid, seriously that was harder than the nipples of a blind lesbian walking through a fish market. I could feel it pressing against my cheek like a board. To my right, something moves, and then there it was, a ball of light, hand to God. It was about the size of a basketball, fairly bright but didn't hurt to look at, floated at about waist height. I'm staring at it, and it starts getting brighter until I have to squint, but when I look away it goes back to normal. This sounds super gay but I can only describe it as a ball of emotions. It pulsed four times, once for each of us I think. The ball flies off to my left, I stood there for forever, or a few seconds, maybe both. We collectively shit our pants as the alarms start going off behind us, lights all over the farm. I looked over my shoulder and was blinded instantly, that's how bright it was. Creepkin levels now at nope, abort abort abort. We're hauling ass across the field, I can't see anything, nearly twist my ankle, so I bust out my flashlight which kind of helps. When I pass the strip where the ball flew by, no joke, I swear the grass has electrostatic charge, I got zapped pretty good a few times. My feet probably touched the ground three times, I'm a goddamn blur. We reach and hop the fence like special Olympians. I'm the first to the jeep, snatch the 30 to 30 lever action out of the back and start pointing it back towards the light seemed like the thing to do at the time, cut me a break. We pile into the wrangler and wing it out of there like a cherry red hardtop bat out of glowing ball hell. Completely silent the whole ride home. Get back to the house, we're all in the front room, can't sleep. No one says a word about the rifle which remained by my side all night except for A to ask me if I was a good shot. I'm from Texas, my hillbilly self was born and raised with one of these in my hands, I can hold my own thank you very much. No way we were doing any more driving that night and numbers equals safety, right guys, guys when the sun rises, we all feel silly. Recount the story until it feels like a dream. Jay goes out to his Wrangler to drive home after breakfast, but the battery's dead and won't recharge. Our phones are all dead despite being on their cords all night. My watch is dead, and the flashlight's new batteries that I put in before we left were dead. Devices and Jeep fine, just had to buy new batteries for them all. To this day, cannot go in a woods for any reason without a weapon and preferably an operator bro with a weapon. Okay, here's a story. B-15. Just got my first personal .22 rifle, all mine, super proud. Little bolt thing, super accurate, loved it. Have a family friend who owns property like 10 minute drive from our house. On this property is an old house. Built by homesteaders around 100 years ago, falling apart. Right next to it is a creek and a field. We used to camp on the far side of the field all the time, also would shoot using a creek as a berm. One day I decided I want to go camping. Bike out there with my 
a box of ammo and normal camping kit. Super excited. Shoot like 200 rounds at cans and stuff from the trash hole nearby, in the 60s someone lived on the property in a trailer and threw trash in this sinkhole type thing. Started getting dark, built a fire and busted out the harmonica to practice. I was terrible at it but it kept my mind busy whilst relaxed. Suddenly something isn't right, I feel like I'm being watched. Hair on neck is raised, heart elevated. My mind starts racing, imagining things unseen out there. Clutching rifle and flashlight scanning the field and trees for movement, shadows playing tricks on my mind and I'm shitting bricks. Moonless night, God damn it! I want to go home now. Wish I'd brought a tent at least to hide inside, it was summer in Texas and was too hot but I wanted that security now. Started building fires bigger. Made a torch of sorts with a stick and a torn up t-shirt I'd brought along with thoughts of making some sort of camouflage for my rifle. Darkness is giving up no secrets but I can definitely hear something out there walking around. Didn't want to shoot because sometimes cows wander onto the property. Fuck 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 fuck. I never wanted this JPG. Maybe coyotes, they're common out here. But no, not in this particular area, too many farmers and rednecks hunt them, they avoid it. Jesus Christ I think I hear breathing. It's kind of circling me, getting closer. Pissing pants by this point, wishing I had something big bore. This was before cell phones were inexpensive, I didn't have one. Just told my parents I was going camping and where. Great, so they'll just find my grisly remnants tomorrow morning after I don't come home. Sweating buckets and running out of wood, fire dying. Contemplating running for it but the woodsman in me wouldn't leave the fire, it was too dry out there. Then suddenly I hear a deep echoing bark from kind of far off. The thing circling me stops for a second. A long pause and then another bark, closer, and the thing takes off in the direction away from me and the bark. An enormous white fluffy dog comes trotting out of the tree lean. Super friendly, has a collar that says, Snowman. Snowman and I chill out for a few hours, only once he turns his head, perks his ears and growls, half barks, and then goes back to normal. Feel totally safe with snowmen there. Eventually fall asleep with the big lug next to me, hot as hell but who gives a damn. Next morning snowman is gone, figure he went home after the thing buggered off for good. Go home and scrape the brick dust out of my boxers. Next day. Talking to property owner. Tell him of that night, confirm no cows were out there. Mention snowman. He looks at me like I'm an asshole. Snowman was my dog, he was killed by a car last year. I what hard and tell him I was serious, snowman was real, I petted him and got covered in his white hair and everything and he saved my skin from whatever out there wanted my nutsack for a coin purse. He doesn't believe me until I dig the shirt out of the wash and show him the hair all over it, he says it looks just like snowman's. Every now and then I hear a bark off in the distance whilst camping there and feel warm inside. Posted this once before. Not sure what it was, but pretty sure it wasn't a roo or anything else natural. Be noggins os faster as g. Mate has guns. We go camping sometimes. Black Range State Forest, Victoria. Late spring. So there are rabbits everywhere. First night we go shooting bunnies, get, like, nine of them in about four hours, from 9 p.m. to midnight, rabbits everywhere, kangaroos everywhere, get back to camp, cook those cute fellas and sleep, next day shooting bottles and targets, overcast day, cloud cover stays all day, and into the night, no stars, no moon, go out looking for rabbits again, not a single one, all the roos are gone too, it's quiet, we're in the back of my mate's truck, with a spotlight, when suddenly we see what look like a pair of bicycle reflectors on the road up, ahead on the crest of a hill, just to shining red circles against a black backdrop, shine spotlight at it, beam barely reached that far, scope up with point two two, can see the row and can't see the lights, look out of scope, and they're still there, scope up again and look closer, mate with spotty yells out that they've gone, look again without scope, and they have indeed gone. 
drive you up to where we saw it and get out for a look. There are some fresh footprints leading up an embankment off the row. Grab point 308 and chamber that motherfucker. Note back to camp quickly and quietly. Brain farted with the date. It was around Easter. Don't know why, said Spring. Get the generator, go in and turn on floodlights. Generator runs out of petrol. Decide to douse the fire and go to bed. Still really quiet. No wind or anything. Guns are in my tent. Feeling safer. It's really, really quiet. Almost as if the silence is getting louder. Suddenly I hear a twig snap outside. Oh nope. Grab point 308 and load it up. Peek outside. It's pitch black, but I can see some embers still in our fire pit. There is a sudden slight gust of wind and smoke blows in my direction. Smells like burning hair. Grab a torch and step slowly out of the tent. Walk over to the fire pit. There's a leg of something sitting on the coals. The hair is singing off it so it was just put there. Wake friends, they look at it. Nope. Grab guns and sit in a locked car for the rest of the night. Pack up so fast the next morning and get out of there. Haven't been back there since. Don't plan on it anytime soon. Op here, first story incoming, friends first, it's better than mine, be in basic training, lost in woods, a stupid private, on the longest FTX at end of cycle, middle of summer, hopped it into transballs.jpg, drills kind of leave us alone so long as we don't mess up too much, and everyone is antsy, wanting to be done, playing pranks on each other, getting smoked, rinse and repeat, drills think it's hilarious so they let it continue, one night I get up to take a leap, Decide I don't need to wake someone else up, supposed to always have a buddy, and go alone. All goes great, get to the latrine, pay the water bill, start the trek back, see a shadow moving around near tents, oh fuck drills. Decide to take a detour around campsite through some trees, come in on far side, it's darker than tar, new moon and clouds equals no visibility. Scared to turn flashlight on, start stumbling around, realize I'm lost. I am a non's regret, rationalize that I can just go back the way I came, instead get more lost, begin to freak out a little, weird noises around me, animals maybe, I don't know, start feeling like I'm being watched, stop walking, crouch down, after a few seconds begin seeing movement at knee level, be from Montana, know nothing about animals out in that neck of the woods, hear a growl, sounds like a wolf or something, it's big and near, no pee no pee no pee no pee no, I want out of here, Whatever I'll take the punishment if a troll sees me, look around, see clearest path, masterplan.exe, start crashing my way down that path, about to start screaming, when, wham, something grabs me, by the shoulders and slams me against a tree, welp, it's been a good life now I'm about to get eaten, and then I realize it's DS Raymond, biggest baddest guy I've ever known, airborne sapper ranger special forces blah blah blah, black as coal, Loved fried chicken, always ate it, always joked about it. Would smoke the ever-living dog shit out of you if you joked about it though. First thought, I'm saved. Second thought, I'm so damned. He covers my mouth, whispers, shut the hell up Pratt. Practically all I can see is the whites of his eyes and teeth. He pulls a damn bar out of his belt, tells me to shut the hell up, stay close and step. Where he steps, we make our way back to the camp. He points me towards my tent and tells me to go to sleep. Last I see before I go inside is him sitting on a big rock, near the middle of the circle of tents, knife in hand. I wake up to an artillery SIM, our drill's preferred FTX alarm clock, pull my camis on, grab rifle and run outside, he's still sitting there, knife tucked under leg but hand still on it, he sees me, stands up, sheathes it, approaches, my anzisna prepared dot GIF. He looks at me and says, Prep there's freaky things out there in them woods, stay out of, M. I asked him what the hell I heard last night, dunno, but it wanted to eat you, and followed us back, shut up and push, like 20 push-ups later, he sends me away, never mentions it again, never get punished, at graduation he tells me to buy a big knife, and always carry it because, there's more out there in the woods than people and bunny rabbits. Hey stalker, hope you enjoyed the video. I could trouble you. Give a like and a sub, it really helps the cause. And since you're already here, why not watch the next video? Anyways, stay comfy. Cortisol is bad for you.